Just before we get started with today's video, let me tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, something nostalgic, and that is Magic Spoon. It's delicious. Magic Spoon takes you on a trip down memory lane. They've got fruited, frosted, cocoa, and peanut butter, which are inspired by those childhood favorites, but they're upgraded for today's consumer. It's like a blast from the past right at your breakfast table. I'm going to carefully put this down. These cereals aren't just delicious, they're fueling. They're filled with 13 to 14 grams of protein per serving, and you can satisfy your cereal cravings any time of the day. No more waiting for breakfast. It's the middle of the afternoon right now, and I'm definitely going to finish that bowl of cereal once we're done with this ad, because it's a great snack as well. They have zero grams of sugar, no cane sugar, corn syrup, or sugar alcohol. You won't believe it. It's just four to five net grams of carbs and 140 calories per serving. Personally, my favorite peanut butter. It tastes fantastic. And knowing that it's wholesome makes me feel like I'm investing myself rather than just stuffing my face with cereal that's full of sugar. Plus, it keeps me full all morning. I mean, what more could you ask for? If you're ready to try it yourself, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash shadows and use the promo code shadows for $5 off any order. Magic Spoon is so confident in the project they offer a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't love it, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. So why wait? Click the link below, grab a variety pack, and rediscover the joy of cereal. There's a link below. And now today's video. Kawaisi City has an airport, a hospital, and is the eighth most populous city in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. From a bird's eye view, it's an unremarkable place, just one of many countless cities that you've likely never heard of and will likely never hear about again. Similar to most of the cities in this part of the world, the population is almost entirely made up of poor families living in low-rise housing with corrugated iron roofs. The exception to this lies in the east of the city, in the district of Dalala. It's here that we see something peculiar. Paved roads, lush green gardens, backyard pools, restaurants, nightclubs, health clinics, hotels, and European-style housing. The difference between the two is night and day. The quality of living in this small area of this nondescript Congolese city is comparable to housing in many European nations. And the reason for this lies a little further to the east, where the landscape gives way to an array of enormous open cast mines that go on for miles, and interspersed among them are large field offices for some of the richest mining corporations in the world. This operation alone has companies from China, Switzerland, Belgium, and Germany, to name a few, and it's just one of literally hundreds of mining centers that dot the country. So, what is it? that has brought them here? What commodity was so valuable that they decided to invest millions into building housing, infrastructure, machinery, and risking the lives of their employees in a country that has been ravaged by war, corruption, and genocide since it first appeared on European maps nearly 200 years ago? Is it gold? Is it diamonds? No, it's neither of those things. The mineral they're looking for is called heterogenite, a jagged, jet black rock speckled with bright blue nodules. Similar to the city built around it, this rock might seem innocuous at first glance. But anyone in the know will tell you that it has one of the highest cobalt concentrations of any naturally occurring material in the world. And without minds like these, the world we live in just wouldn't be able to exist. So let's start with the basics, shall we? Why is cobalt actually important? Well, in short, cobalt is one of the primary components of lithium-iron batteries. The very same batteries that exist inside pretty much every portable electronic device and electronic vehicle that has been built in the last 15 years. The very same batteries that are going to allow us to switch to renewable energy. Without this particular kind of battery, the lifestyle that has become ubiquitous among high-income nation citizens would be almost entirely impossible. Across the world, mining operations have sprung up to meet the surge in demand that has come with the need for more and more consumer electronics. In spite of this, economists estimate that this year, 2023, demand for cobalt is going to exceed global supply for the first time ever. And then there is the DRC, a nation that is no stranger to being on the supplier's end of the European supply chain. Not its own, the DRC accounts for more than half of the entire cobalt supply. Not only that, but the DRC is rich across the board in most natural minerals and gems. Lying beneath the ground is nearly $24 trillion worth of natural resources simply just waiting there to be extracted. Successfully doing that would transform the DRC into not only the richest nation in Africa, but one of the richest nations in the world. But instead, the DRC ranks as the seventh lowest GDP per capita in the world. And the reason for that is colonialism. 
Look, we've already covered the horrific events that transpired during the time Belgium called this nation its colony, and before that when the King of Belgium called its lands and people his personal property. Following their release from colonial control, the country quickly fell into dictatorship that spawned decades of civil wars, coups, and genocides collectively known as the Congo Crisis. As of today, there is a democratically elected government running the country, with the majority of its control centered in the South, though the legitimacy of this democracy is a little bit dubious. There are also several anti-government militias that control much of the West of the country. And this brings us to the recent boom in demand for cobalt. Regular supply and demand economics would suggest that the DRC was on the cusp of becoming one of the richest nations in Africa. But of course, it ain't that simple. You see, when a mining company wants to set up a mine in a foreign nation, they go to that nation's government and they purchase land, mining licenses, mineral rights, and they go through all of these bureaucratic hoops to ensure the security and legitimacy of their mine. They then go through the enormous expense of establishing a mine with equipment and infrastructure to support it, assuming that it's not there already. And this all begins to fall apart when the government of said country cannot fully enforce their own laws across the entire land. This is the case in the DRC, where the mining company employees and expensive equipment are at risk of attack from things like militia insurgents or even just simple theft from local citizens. This can be resolved in a reduced capacity if the mining company simply purchases the product of domestic mining companies that are smaller and more willing to take the risks associated with operating in their own country. As for the city that we began today's video with, Kowasi is situated deep in the south of the DRC and is well within the government's primary center of power, so it's not so much of a risk for the international mining companies to directly establish operations there. However, the problem comes when those small domestic companies don't have the output to meet the demand of the large mining consortiums. It is then that they turn to other mining operations to make up the shortfall. And it's here that we come into contact with something known as artisanal mining. And I guess we should really clarify here, artisanal means to produce in small batches using traditional methods. It's great marketing for a coffee roaster wearing suspenders and a docker cap. But for mining operations, it's a nightmare of human rights abuses. In essence, an artisanal miner is a private individual who earns money by selling minerals, gems, and the like that they acquired without any bureaucracy that the large mining companies went through. Things like government oversight, health and safety regulations, ownership of the land and workers' rights are very, very optional when it comes to artisanal mining. Because it is, in essence, a private individual pulling rocks out of the ground, there isn't anything inherently illegal about it. It's how they get to those rocks that makes artisanal mining so horrific. Journalists visiting these mines have described the harrowing conditions that people work in, often for less than $3 a day. It's not uncommon that all the men in a family will work in the same cobalt mine, children included. In fact, children are perhaps best suited. Their small size allows them to fit into the small tunnels that spawn from these mines. When those operating in the mine hit upon a seam of cobalt, they'll follow it deep into the earth, getting down to and even exceeding depths of 60 feet. These rabbit warrens are rarely more than two feet wide and are entirely unsupported, which means that cave-ins occur on a monthly or even weekly basis, with anyone inside being buried alive, many of which are children as young as six and seven. There are many cases of homeless children being used as an easily renewable source of labor for these mines. Many will enter the mines that adults cannot fit into simply on the promise of food. If they don't bring up enough cobalt, they'll have their food withheld, and they're often given a variety of narcotics that will suppress appetite and improve their productivity. This in itself is bad enough, but it actually isn't the worst part. Much the same as the fishermen seeking good fishing waters, miners who hope for a cobalt-rich mine have turned to superstition to improve their fortunes. The truly bad part is the belief that having sex with a virgin before starting a new site improves a person's chances of hitting it big. This has led to a spike in the rape of female children, and there have even been cases of infants as young as 18 months old being abducted and raped by artisanal miners. Women that are involved are often tasked with the cleaning of the rocks, which they often do in the nearest available water source. Not only does this bring the heavy metal content of the water up to toxic levels, it also poisons the women by being absorbed into their skin. This has led to a spike in stillbirths and genetic deformities in those that are carried to term. Then there are the mines that operate in the west of the country, the ones run by the anti-government militias. Cobalt deposits can be used as a means of funding their war effort. Often when a village is captured by the militia, the inhabitants are transported to the nearest cobalt mine and forced to work under threat of death. 
Where in the south and east of the Congo there is some semblance of choice as to whether they work in the mines, many are simply forced to enter those conditions without a say in the matter. Between 2010 and 2021, the quantity of cobalt coming out of the DRC doubled from 60,000 to 120,000 metric tons, accounting for nearly 70% of the world's total production in 2020. It's impossible to say precisely what percentage of that output was from artisanal mining and what was from commercial mining enterprises, though the number is estimated to be around 20 to 30 percent. It can be difficult to fully appreciate the fact that the cobalt that is mined in the DRC in reprehensible conditions by children and slave laborers is the same cobalt that makes it into our devices. And in 2019, that connection finally made it back to the companies who sold us the devices. In December of that year, a motion was filed by a human rights advocacy group on behalf of 15 Congolese families against some of the largest tech companies in the world, including Google's parent company, Alphabet, as well as Apple, Tesla, Dell, and Microsoft. They stand accused of aiding and abetting and subsequently benefiting from forced labor practices in the DRC. The complaint stated that, quote, The cobalt supply chain is a venture that exists for the purpose of maintaining a steady supply of cheap cobalt that is mined by peasants and children. The supply chain is, by design, hidden and secretive to allow all participants to profit from cheap cobalt mined under extremely hazardous conditions by desperate children forced to perform extremely hazardous labor without safety equipment of any kind. They cited something called the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, also known as the TVPRA, which in essence says that a company that is associated with a venture, which itself is responsible for a human trafficking offense, will also be liable for those offenses, assuming the company reasonably knew that said human trafficking offenses were taking place. On the 25th of August 2020, a collective of large tech companies filed a motion to dismiss on the grounds that an entire global supply chain cannot be considered a venture and that if they were to follow the language of the TVPRA, it would, in fact, implicate every single company in the world that is part of the global cobalt supply chain. You, of course, can't sue every participant of an entire global supply chain, and that was the point that the lawyers were making. On the 2nd of November 2021, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia dismissed the case, citing lack of standing and incorrect reliance on TVPRA. However, the point wasn't really to win the case. There was very little chance that a non-profit organization was going to be able to take on the collective lawyers of some of the richest companies in the world, and they knew it. You don't get global headlines by telling the public about terrible mining conditions in an obscure country. However, you will get global headlines if you sue the largest tech companies in the world for human rights abuses. And that's exactly what happens, and that's why we're even talking about this topic in the first place today, because it was headline news. And whether you saw those headlines before or not, you will have now seen this video, and you'll now be aware of the problem. This was the plan of the human rights organization, to bring attention to the issue because damaging these companies' profits by informing the public is the only way to get them to change. Look, there is no shortage of hardship in the world, and the citizens of the Congo know this better than anyone. The history is perhaps the most poignant example of European colonial exploitation, not just because of the brutality that was interwoven into their subjugation, but because there are still the shadows of European influence in the exploitation today. The lawsuit against the major tech companies named many of the suppliers that these tech companies used to source their cobalt. Many of them were European, and three of them were based in Belgium. Sins of the father and all that, these companies are not responsible for past atrocities, but they are responsible for sourcing their cobalt. From what we could tell, all of the larger mining companies have done their due diligence and followed the word of the law when it comes to sourcing, but that doesn't mean they aren't buying any artisanally mined cobalt. For all intents and purposes, they are. The problem is that the supply chain with the Congo is so complex that it's impossible to verify every single rock that passes through their facilities. Lawmakers accept this difficulty and have set up their guidelines to simply limit the purchase of artisanal cobalt as much as possible. These due diligence responsibilities are outlined by an organization called the OECD, if you'd like to see exactly what they're like. In essence, you can't operate within the DRC without getting some dirt on your hands, which is brought about by the fact that we, that is to say, the consumers, will always lean towards the person who can sell at the lowest price. Unfortunately, there's no easy or simple solution to a situation as complex as this. Even if we were able to stop buying their goods, we would deprive the government and the people of money that could be used to improve their quality of life and bring some stability to the region. On the other hand, continuing to buy their goods will inevitably put money into the pockets of corrupt officials and militias alike. We can't tell you which is the better option. All we can do is say that sometimes the best solution 
is to embrace the brutality of the world, if only to avoid an even worse alternative.